Thank you very much, Linda. No, seriously, my own talent is, is I can draw, and actually can't draw either. I'm going to take you on a journey this morning. Let's imagine the year is 2116, and we've somehow in, invented the teleporting system. And I teleport you all from here to there. Where are you? Could be France. La Rue do something, it says in the, in the text there. You're a bit lost, aren't you? Not really sure where you are. You can look around, you can ask some people, maybe there are no people around. How would we solve this with technology? Yeah, GPS. We'd get our smartphone out, we'd fire up Apple Maps or Google Maps, and we'd find a little blue dot and we'd zoom out. So this is like a street view. We zoom out. Aha! Now it's getting a bit clearer, and maybe there's a little blue dot superimposed on here somewhere. It's still a bit complex. You can't really answer the question, where are you, can you? We zoom out a bit further, aha, we're in Jersey. This is where I live. This is a great map, except it's kind of complex, isn't it? There's lots of colors, lots of textures going on. It's hard to see some detail. One of the nice things with Google Maps is we can remove the satellite view. And that becomes much, much clearer. And now we can see the intricate networks of lanes and roads connecting all the different places. Who's heard of Jersey? Right, so that's not everybody. So some of you won't know where this little island is. So again, we have to start the zooming out thing. We zoom out. We can see there's some more islands next to it. We zoom out some more. Right, it's near France. We zoom out further. There we go. So now we have some context about what Jersey is and where it is. So you should definitely come to Jersey. Jersey is an amazing place. Lots of things to do. One of the things you should do when you come through Jersey Airport is you should pick up one of these maps. It's a visitor map. And the visitor map is a very kind of low detail map. And it basically tells you the things you need to go and see. So it's broken up into four parts. Relatively easy to understand. Lots of nice colorful graphics. Some places of interest. This is where I got battered on Sunday in the waves trying to surf badly. We can zoom into the town section. There's a bit more detail. You know, some of the road names we can see there. This is not entirely accurate. I mean, this bit here, this blue bit, the tide actually goes out. So if you park your boat there, you will find it on dry land at some point. And this bathing pool here actually does get filled by water, which is quite useful because I imagine kids pee in it in the summer. This map has a bunch of points of interest on it, things you want to go and see and look at and do. Contrast this with like an ordnance survey map, which gives you a much more higher detailed view of a location, in this case, Jersey. So here we can see lots of information about the textures and the land type and the contours and these sorts of things. But it's a bit harder to understand, isn't it? You need a little bit of training and intelligence to start interpreting this data. One of the things these two maps have in common is they show you selected highlights. And when you come to Jersey on holiday next year, and you should, you should go and visit Elizabeth Castle. Elizabeth Castle is a, a castle, it's like a little island just to the south of Jersey, uh, built in the 16th century, and it was basically put there to stop the French and the English taking over Jersey and so on. And it's beautiful, you know, big granite stonework and, and all that sort of thing. And as you wander around this castle on your holiday, you get to the center, you get to the high point, and there's this really weird big granite, uh, uh, this concrete thing stuck on top of the granite. And it's just really jarring. And it makes no sense. You've got this ornate stonework and then this big concrete thing on top. And you kind of look at it and go, wow, why, when? And the answer is really in the history. Uh, Jersey was one of, one of the places in, in World War II that was occupied. The Germans came along, and they basically re-fortified the existing fortifications. So that's why uh, we've got things like these gun emplacements stuck inside these granite walls, for example. So the history is the key here. And of course, when you come to Jersey, you need to go and buy a guidebook because it tells you all of this sort of stuff. Or you can go to the website. Again, all of this information is freely available out there. So that's my advert for Jersey over with. What has this got to do with anything <laughs> around software? Well, one of the things I'm going to talk about is visualizing, documenting, and exploring software architectures. 
And one of the things that I do is my kind of paid job that pays my mortgage is I run workshops around the world. And as part of that workshop, I give people requirements to say, break yourself up into groups, go design a solution, draw some pictures. And these are the types of pictures I actually get during my workshop. I've been running this for 10 years or so. I've got 15 gigabytes of photos that look exactly like this. I promise you I've not made any of these things up. And sometimes when people are doing this exercise, I've got a lot more I could show you, but we'll stop there. So sometimes when I'm, when, I, when I'm listening to people do this exercise in groups, they'll say things like this. Uh, they'll be drawing a box or a line, and they'll say, this doesn't make any sense, but we'll explain it later. Right. When is later exactly? When you present your diagrams? How many people present diagrams that are in documentation? You know, sometimes you're not always around to explain stuff. And of course, it's all about teams. If one team is creating a set of documentation and another team is creating a separate documentation, those diagrams, those documents make sense in that context. But if they switch, guess what happens? You get this kind of big whack moment. It's like, I have no idea what any of this stuff means because I was not part of that conversation creating that artifact. And when I ask people to review the diagrams, they say things like this. You know, I'm not sure what this box arrow shape thing is. Why are some lines pink? Well, someone had a pink Sharpie and they used it. There are no annotations on the lines. The sticky notes have fallen off the whiteboard and so on and so on and so on. And I ask people, well, I've seen your diagrams. You clearly didn't find this exercise easy. So what was challenging about it? And they say, th say things like, well, we're not really sure where to start. We don't know what to draw. We're not sure what notation we should use, what level of detail we should design to, what level of detail we should document to, and so on and so forth. And it seems this is one of the things that we've forgotten how to do as, a, as an industry. Who here uses UML? All right, I'm going to count these on two hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I reckon there's 15 people maximum here out of a large audience. So what's everybody else doing? Well, I guess the answer is diagrams like the ones I just showed you. I, I've asked this question everywhere I've been, and I think it's in the sort of 10% mark these days. I actually think this is op optimistic. More and more people are adopting ad hoc notations rather than using something like UML, which fixes a lot of issues, for example. I do use UML myself, but I don't find it's very useful for doing software architecture stuff, you know, for describing how a system works at a, at a high level, an overview level. But I do use UML for things like class diagrams, sequence diagrams, state charts, and, and so on. If you go and ask Google what it thinks a software architecture diagram looks like, you get stuff like this. Just page after page after page of very pretty, colorful, Visio-style, PowerPoint-style block pictures. There may be some UML in here, but you'll just skip that stuff because it's too complex. And I think ultimately what we get to are diagrams like this. And, and whenever I go and visit organizations, this is basically what I see on wiki pages. And half of these things don't make any sense at all. Look, we've got layers with no lines between them. We've got different color codings. We've got acronyms and all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. This is hard. It shouldn't be hard, but it is hard. And, and pretty much every single team I work with around the world struggles with this exercise. And it's not an exercise in designing software. The actual design part's dead easy. The exercise is really about communication, visualization, and describing how a system works. And for me, the real irony here is Agile. Over the past 15 years, Agile's made us awesome at visualization. Information dashboards, radiators, Kanban boards, story walls, and so on and so forth. And we've totally forgotten how to visualize the stuff we're building. It seems tragic. And this is all about good communication. Right? If you want to move fast as a team, if you want to be agile and adaptive and switch direction, you need good communication. That's essentially all this is about right here. So there are a couple of things to, to look at here. One's notation, one's content. Notation's dead easy to sort out. Just be conscious of the notation that you're using. Uh, there are some tips on this slide here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link to my book, which you can download for free at the end. All of this stuff is talked about. The one thing I will point out is this last one, responsibilities. We often joke that naming stuff is hard in software development. Do you think this is true? Yeah. So if naming stuff is hard, why are most architecture diagrams just named boxes? Literally a box with one word in. My advice here is just add more text to your architecture diagrams, because that gives you a nice at-a-glance view of what's going on. 
So here are two examples of the same diagram. A typical looking one on this side, on the left, and a, a one with more text on the right. And it just, it just adds a mu much more detail to it. It's not hard to do, but it just adds, it removes a lot of the ambiguity. Content is really the more interesting thing here. So when I ask people to draw software architecture diagrams, what is it they should be drawing? What level of detail? And it's hard to put all of that information on a single picture. And this is why when you read the classic architecture books, they'll always talk about views. The logical view of the system, the physical view, the development view, the design view, the infrastructure view, the deployment view, and so on and so on and so on. And there are lots and lots of different view catalogs that, des that describe uh, mechanisms uh, and techniques for describing software systems, for example. The one thing they all pretty much all have in common is that you have this logical view of your system, which is functional building blocks, and you have some sort of developmental design view, which is really how those logical building blocks are reflected in the code. And they're separate. And we've been taught to keep them separate. And I don't know why. Because if you have this logical view that, that, that describes logical building blocks, and this development view that somehow describes code, well, there needs to be a good mapping between the two, and there's often not. And this is when people say to me, well, we have these wonderful architecture diagrams on our wall, but they don't match the code. Have you seen this? Is this happening right now? Yeah, a few people are admitting, yeah. So we have these diagrams, and they just don't make sense. They don't reflect what the reality of the code says. George Fairbanks, uh, in his book, Just Enough Software Architecture, calls this the model code gap. And it's very, very simple to explain. When we're having an architecture discussion, we use terms like components and module and subsystem and layer. But in our languages that we use to program, we don't have these constructs. So for those of you who are Java developers here, is there a component keyword in Java? No. Is there a layer keyword in Java? No. We have to create these abstract constructs based upon packages, namespaces, interfaces, classes, the, you know, the core building blocks that we have. And sometimes the two words just don't match, the code and the model. And if your diagrams don't reflect the code, they're basically pointless. And you may also just throw them away, unless you're using them for architecture, and that's a totally different purpose, I guess. And here's the big thing here. As an industry, even in 2016, we don't have a common way to describe software. We don't have a common vocabulary that we can use interchangeably amongst all of us. We think we do, but we actually don't. Who likes a good quiz? Cool, we're going to have a quiz. Right, what's this? It's a map of Paris. What's the blue thing in the middle? It's a water, it's a river. Right, what is a river? Come on. <laughs> it's a body of flowing water, it flows one way or the other, right. So using this information and this knowledge, and we understand what a river is, we can go to other places around the world, and we can identify other rivers. This is an easy quiz. Right, what's this? <laughs> it's a floor plan. What's it a floor plan for? A bathroom, perfect. What's this thing here? A toilet. What is a toilet? <laughs> you don't know. Worrying. <laughs> What's a toilet? It's somewhere you take a piss in, or it's another body of flowing water, if you want to put it that way. Right, so again, we know what a toilet is, and we can go and use this knowledge to identify other toilets in the environment. Are there any electrical engineers in the room? Perfect. Right, so there are a couple of ways you can represent uh, electrical circuits. You've got a schematic view and a kind of more pictorial view. Uh, What's this thing here? It's a resistor. What is a resistor? It resists something, yeah. Re reduces flow or something. I'm, I'm not an electrical person. If I had a big box of electrical components here at the front with capacitors and resistors and switches and bulbs and, and stuff like that, could you come to the front and find me a resistor and go, here it is? Yeah, because we know how to identify resistors. And if we had the color coding chart, we could, we could identify how strong that resistor was. Right, this quiz is far too easily. Let's ramp up the complexity. Ready? What's that? 
Right, so, so let's start with the basics. What type of diagrams are these? Right, the UML component diagrams. There's a 1.x version and a 2.x version. Don't ask me which one is which. What are each of the boxes? Components, yay. And what is a component? Uh -huh. It's a logical construct. And it's absolutely meaningless because this one here is a database component. component. I'm not sure if this is a like Oracle deployment or an in-memory database. There is a JDBC interface here. Uh, the ones over on this side are labeled application or UI. So I guess they're UI components, or maybe just UIs or applications. And the ones in the middle, I have absolutely no idea about. They're just generic components. They could be microservices. They could be components that run in the database or run in the application. I really have no idea. And unless you look at one of the other views, like the deployment view, this diagram basically tells you nothing. You see what I mean about adding more text to pictures? Look, seminar thing. What's it do? Does something with seminars, I guess. And this is where we are in the software world. And, and to boil this back down to its very essence, imagine we're building the, the world's most boring web application. For some of us, the web application is a component of the entire system. It's a part of, that's what the dictionary definition says. For others, when we use the word component, we, we're using it to refer to something inside the web application. Same words, very different levels of abstraction. We talk about domain-driven design and having this ubiquitous language between us and the business. We don't have that for us. That's the odd thing about all of this. And for me, having that common set of abstractions is way more useful than any sort of standardized common notation at this stage of our industry's maturity. I would like to get to you know, electrical engineering's one diagram format to rule them all. I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. And a great example of this principle in action is maps, real-world maps. If we take two maps of Copenhagen, put them side by side, they show the same things, don't they? The same abstractions. But they might use different color coding, uh, shadings, icons, and that sort of thing. Same abstractions, differing notations. How do we decipher the notation? There's a key in the corner, a legend. So the maps are a really nice, simple, self-describing documentation. And whatever language we come up with, it needs to reflect the technology that we're using. So I want to eliminate that whole logical development view thing going on. So the way I do this is very simply, when I look at a software system, it's made up of containers. A container is something like a web app, a standalone app, a database. It's something that needs to be running for your system to work. You look inside my containers, they contain components. This is just a grouping of related stuff with a nice, clean interface on top. Because I mostly deal with Java and C-sharp, my components are made from classes, and we're done. That's it. It's just a simple hierarchy to describe static structure. If you're dealing with functional languages, maybe this is functions, uh, sorry, modules and functions. JavaScript might be components or modules and objects. So you're going to have to take this approach and meld it to the technology that you're using so it makes sense. What I'm trying to do here is build a very, very simple static model of a software system. And then the other stuff is really easy to document around the outside. So if you want to show how a, a user story or a feature works, it's just a sequence or collaboration diagram that shows how things in your static model interact at runtime. That's it. Off the back of this, we can then draw some pictures. So pictures are secondary here. I'll have a system context diagram, a containers diagram, a components diagram per container, and then optionally, I might have some lower level class diagrams or something that reflects the code. To give you a really quick example of this, again, this is all covered in the book that, uh, that you can download. I, I created a really simple content aggregator when I moved back to Jersey called Tech Tribes. It just lists local people, businesses, blogs, and tweets. This is a context diagram of Tech Tribes. The thing in the middle is my system. This diagram shows how my system fits into the rest of the world. You know, the different types of users, actors, personas, and also the, the key systems that we interact with. If this was interactive, we would select it pinch to zoom in, and now we get to the level two, the container diagram. And all I've done here is I've exploded out that middle box to show the containers inside it. It's the web app talking to a bunch of databases, and there's a standalone process also talking to a bunch of databases. Again, if this is interactive, we select one of the containers, we pinch to zoom in, we show the components inside it. Same deal. If we want more detail, we pinch to zoom in, we get down to level four. That's it. 
It's just a simple hierarchy of static building blocks. So the reason for the infomercial thing about Jersey is because I wanted to get the seed planted about maps really early. The diagrams I like to draw with teams are basically a set of maps on top of a software system, on top of a code base. And again, we can use them to zoom in and out at different levels of detail, and we can, we can use it to describe and, and, and discuss our software system with different types of audiences. You know, the context diagram is very high level, works great for non-technical and business people. Uh, me as a developer, I want something very low level, and if I'm going to hand my system over to operations and support staff, well, maybe they want something in the middle. You know, this is a list of things you need to look after, but don't worry about what's inside it. The notation, again, it's very easy. One of the things I don't want you to uh, take away from this talk is you must use this style of notation. This is the one I use because it's very simple. But again, use whatever notation you want, provided you have a good set of abstractions to base it upon. And you can use shapes and color to differentiate different things. But for me, really, shape and color supplements an existing diagram. So you should be able to take all the shape and the color off, and it still makes perfect sense. I'm also not saying that you should only draw these types of diagrams, because of course there are lots of other ways you might want to describe how a software system works. Uh, and that's where I will point you to things like Philip Crutchen's 4 plus 1 model, and uh, that book there by Owen Woods and Nick Rosensky. This is not a design process. So I'm not trying to uh, dictate a hierarchical design process. The, the C4 thing is just a collection of diagrams to describe software. And this is useful either during upfront design or retrospectively if you have an existing code base for that document. Right, and now it gets tooling. And this is the question that people always ask me. And up until recently, I had basically had been saying, just use Visio. And that hurts. <laughs> that really hurts. The diagrams I showed you, you can do them in any general purpose diagramming tool. Physio, Omnigraphal, Glyphy, Draw.io, you name it, you can do it. It's just boxes and lines. I follow uh, Kelly Sommers on Twitter, and she, she asks her followers, and she's got like 20,000 followers or something, what's a good Mac app for making architecture slides? This is the summary. Not one person suggested a modeling tool in 2016. This is crazy. Building architects don't use Visio, do they? Well, I hope not. They use a modeling tool. They use something like AutoCAD, and they create a, a very detailed three-dimensional model of the thing they want to build, and then they surface different views, cross-sections and floor plans and, and all that sort of stuff. And the irony here, of course, is we build this software for building people. And we can't do this ourselves. It's crazy. So this is my uh, vendor alert product hat. I'm, I'm building some modeling tooling at the moment. It's called Structurizer. Uh, one of the simple ways you can use this for free is I created a very simple DSL, and it's basically a DSL that implements the C4 construct. So essentially, you wire together people, software systems, containers, components, and you create some diagrams. This is still just you know, manually doing all the work yourself, essentially. So why don't we just auto-generate this stuff? Has anybody tried auto-generating diagrams from code? What happens? you get a mess. Is that because your code's a mess? Hopefully not, but you never know. But normally, these diagrams are a mess because they're showing too much detail. And I, I can show you a really trivial, simple example. So in, in the Java world, there's a framework called Spring. Spring does everything. And there's a sample application called the Spring Pet Clinic. This is the architecture diagram that the uh, Spring team use. It's basically stuff in the browser, a controller layer, a service layer, a repository layer. It's a traditional, simple three-layer uh, three architecture. You download the code, it looks like this. You, f you open it in your IDE, you say, create me a uh, diagram, and you get that. Remember, this is only a toy application. I did try to move the boxes around to make sure that none of the lines overlapped. It's basically an impossible task. The problem with these tools is that they see code. They don't see the logical constructs that we want to talk about when we're having an architecture discussion modules, components, layers, and services, for example. And we can trace this problem right back years and years and years. So I found a paper from the 90s, and it basically says, if you ask an engineer to draw a diagram of their system, you get a very high-level picture. If you reverse engineer a diagram from code, that diagram is super accurate, but it doesn't match the diagram that the engineer drew. Totally different way of thinking about the system. It's the model of code gap again. 
And of course, to answer this question, we need to really, really ask ourselves, well, what is a component? And again, my definition of a component is going to vary depending on which code base I'm looking at at the time, because everybody has a different implementation strategy for building components, for example. If we take our, our simple Spring Pet Clinic example, you know, what's important in this code base? Let's focus on showing the important stuff. So if I remove some of the things I deem to be not important in drawing an architecture diagram, you get this sort of picture once you start to move the boxes and lines around. So basically, I excluded all of the value objects, the domain um, classes, the entities, and the utility classes. And now we can start to recreate that layer diagram that we saw before. But it's still showing code. And, and what I really want to show is something you know, one level up. I want to zoom out one notch to not show interfaces and classes. I want to show components. So I have to make some assumptions. What in this code base can situate, um, is, is, you know, what, what things make a component in this code base? In this example, it's the combination of the interface and the implementation class. But in a larger system, you, you might have a bunch more stuff going on. Ultimately, what I want to do is draw this type of diagram automatically from the code. So it's continually kept up to date. Now, we often say that you know, the code is the final embodiment of all the architectural ideas. So the interesting question is, can we get that back out again? So if, I, if, if you give me any code base, can I extract some architectural concepts from that code base automatically? And the answer is, well, not really. So if you give me your code base, it's really hard to find a list of people, a list of users, a list of actors from a given code base. I have to start doing things like scraping configuration files and scraping databases and, and looking for role definitions and that sort of thing. The same with the list of software systems that your software interacts with. That's often not very well specified in the code itself. You know, it's API calls and dropping documents on file shares and documents on message buses and that sort of thing. It's hard to get a list of containers from a code base as well. You know, give me the list of all of the web apps, Windows services, standalone applications and databases that make up your system. Again, that's a hard thing to do just by extracting information from a Visual Studio solution file, for example. It's possible, but it's error prone. The thing I really want to do here is extract a list of components automatically, because that's the most volatile level of information. It changes the most frequently, so that's really the thing I'm most interested in automating here. But it comes down to that, what is a component? And in order to identify components, you need something like an architecturally evident coding style. So this is George Fairbanks' solution to the model of code gap. An architecturally evident coding style is basically putting hints and metadata in your source code so that your source code reflects your architectural vision and intent. That sounds very grandiose. It's, re it's really, really simple. It's stuff like using naming conventions. So if you have a diagram here and there's a box that says logging component, make sure there's something in the code that, that is named logging component. It's really that simple. Maybe it's around namespacing and packaging. Maybe it's about having one namespace per component. Maybe it's about adding machine-readable metadata, annotations, attributes. Maybe it's about using the module support in the language to, to you know, say that one module equals our component. Those sorts of things. Once you have a code base with these sorts of rules present, you can then extract them very simply. And that's really my goal here. I want to extract as much information as I can from the code and supplement it with the stuff that's a bit tricky to find. And I want to bring back this concept of an architecture description language. I see far too many people just drawing boxes and lines diagrams, and you can't query a diagram. There's no model behind it. An architecture description language is basically just a textual description of a system, normally static structure. And there are lots of implementations of architecture description languages out there, but they're not really used in mainstream software development. But what we can do is we can take that concept and write one using code, and that's what I've done. And this is really the other half of Structurizer. So there are a couple of open source libraries on GitHub, if GitHub is working now. It was uh, down earlier. Uh, there's one for Java, one for .NET. And basically what they do is, is they're a, a very simple implementation of the C4 stuff. So there are a bunch of classes representing people, software systems, containers, components. You create them and wire them together. In both libraries, uh, there are some additional things which use static analysis, 
static analysis and reflection techniques to go and find things in the code base. So the .NET one uses Roslyn, and there's a, a, a bytecode engineering library underneath the Java one. This is the sort of thing you can do. So you create a person and a software system to represent things in the real world, and you wire them together. You create a view, you add some styling, you upload it to Structurizer via an API, it draws you a picture. You write more code, you get more pictures. Again, this is the very simplistic view, but this doesn't really capture the power of, of an executable architecture description language. So if we go back to my Spring Pet Clinic example, you know, let's create something that describes this. The Spring Pet Clinic example is basically an employee of the vet, the pet clinic, um, using the system so we can model that with code. From a container's perspective, it's just a web app talking to a database. So we can create a container for the web app, a container for the database, and just wire them together with some code. This is just creating a, a, an object graph in memory, essentially. I don't want to have to do that for the components, so this is why I built this component finder thing, which uses static analysis and reflection techniques to go and find components based upon a set of pluggable rules. And those pluggable rules come back to the architecturally evident coding styles, looking for naming conventions, looking for annotations or attributes, and so on and so forth. So to, to document the Spring Pet Clinic system, it's basically that. So there's a, a pre-built Spring component finder, and it goes and finds Spring components. In, in simple terms, all it does is it looks for the Spring annotations, at controller, at service, at repository, and it does some bundling together of the impl implementation class and the interface. That's essentially all it does, and it finds the dependencies between the things it finds. We can then write some more codes to wire things together, so we can say things like, Go find me all of the Spring MVC controllers you just found and make the user use them. Do the same with the repositories and make them use the database. So again, we can manipulate this model because it's just sitting in code. It's in memory. And then once you have a model, you can start to visualize it. And, and, and for me, this is where it gets really interesting. So Structurizer, the open source libraries, uh, allow you to create views. The views correspond to the C4 diagrams. And you can add and remove different elements from those views. Once you add a bit of styling and you upload it via the API, you get some diagrams. So this is the context diagram for the Spring Pet Clinic system. It's the user using the system. This is all generated from code. That's the container diagram. It's the user using the web app, the web app using the database. Again, all of that came from the code I showed you. And that's the diagram I briefly showed you before. So this is the component diagram for the Spring Pet Clinic system. All of these boxes here in the middle are extracted automatically from the code base. The text in the boxes, that's actually the top-level java.comment. So what I want to do is use the source code as a, an, an, a repository of lots of useful information and pull as much of that information as I possibly can out. Because it's a model, we can do things like generate keys very simply. So gone are the days of you know, complex notation. If you, double -click, so if you go to the live version of this diagram, if you double-click a component, it takes you to the GitHub page where the source code is. So again, it's reinforcing that diagrams as maps concept. You click through the levels, you pinch the zoom in, and you ultimately get from the source code to the top level or vice versa. I love this tweet. I thought it was really, really funny. The reason I put this tweet in is basically, does this approach scale? And the answer is not really if you use it naively. Because again, what you don't want to show is everything. This is what happened when I threw my own tooling at one of my own systems, and it's too complex. But because this model is in code, it's in memory, we can write more code to manipulate the model. So for example, it's very easy to say, go and find me all of the, in this case, Spring MVC controllers, and rather than showing all of the components for the web app on a single picture, let's draw multiple pictures, one per slice, where the starting point for a slice is a controller, a web app controller. And the net result is you get a, a larger number of much, much simpler pictures. So we're partitioning, we're reducing the complexity. You don't have to use my structurizer tooling. Again, once you have that model, you can do a bunch of things with it, such as throw it through GraphViz. That's all supported in the open source library. And again, you can take it. It's just a, a, a big JSON document um, with a, a graph inside, and you can do anything you want with it. If you hook this into your build pipeline, your your architecture uh, artifacts remain up to date. That's the whole point of this, essentially. So that's uh, most of the content around visualization. 
Documentation was also in the title of this talk, so I just want to talk about documentation briefly because it's something that I see teams not doing very well or actually not doing at all. I'm sure you're not guilty of this, of course. And it's all because of our friend, the Agile Manifesto. And, well, rather, people, people misinterpreting the Agile Manifesto, should I say. Given any code base, you know, if I drop you in a code base like that first picture I showed you, I, I teleport you to that random leafy lane, you can start to explore and make some assumptions, but it's going to take you a while to get to somewhere you understand, to get to somewhere you know. And that's really the thing here. What I want to do is I want to fast track people. I want to fast track their understanding. This is tactics for better teams, for onboarding new staff quickly, for example. And the code doesn't tell us everything. The code can't tell us why. It can't tell us the intent around things like design decisions, for example. And we also have this thing about tribal knowledge. You know, there are always little silos in our teams, little teams of specialists who know everything about a certain part of the system, and that's fine until they leave. And this is the bus factor thing. And the bus factor is not just about buses. So, you know, someone gets run over by a bus, that's unfortunate. Someone goes on sabbatical for a year, and then we have to fire somebody else. I don't use animations, you can tell. And, and you end up with this much smaller team, and they have these odd conversations like, what's that thing there, and how does it work? And someone says, never seen it. It wasn't part of my little tribe. And that's the sort of thing that can kill productivity, essentially. And this is where our friend, the SAD, comes into play. The aptly named SAD. And there are lots of templates out there for this. You know, it's, a, it's a, normally a good way to describe a software system and how it works, and it has a lot of really interesting content, but the delivery mechanism is suboptimal, shall we say. So one of the things I do with Teams is I just rename it. It turns out you can do a lot of things just by renaming, uh, and I call it a guidebook, much like the little travel guidebook that you buy when you're in Jersey. And the guidebook has maps to help you navigate, that's what the diagrams are for, it tells you what's interesting to go and see, because if you have a million lines of Java code, I can guarantee most of that is not interesting. It's just the same thing repeated over and over and over again. So let's point people to those sites. History and culture, why does this system look like a system of two halves? Let's explain that to people. And let's do all the practical stuff around building, supporting, configuring, and so on. And let's use our documentation to describe what the code doesn't. That's my biggest tip around documentation. I'm not going to go through these in, in any particular detail. Again, it's all in the book that I'll, I'll give you a link to download. My, do, my documentation has a context section to set the scene, some sort of functional overview. It describes something around the quality attributes, the non-functional requirements, performance and security, and so on. It details the constraints that were present when we built and, and, and uh, designed this thing initially, because they always come back to bite us. The principles we're adopting for development, so how do we keep things consistent? What sort of things should developers do? I have a software architecture section. This is normally called the logical view in most architecture document templates. I got into far too many arguments about why it was logical and not physical, so I just changed the name of the section, job done. This is where a lot of those diagrams I showed you go. I might talk about external interfaces if I'm dealing with lots of external interfaces. Uh, I might have a code section that talks about interesting parts of the code. Again, it's the sites and points of interest thing. Data section, talk about data, infrastructure, deployment, operations and support. So again, some of the usual sorts of things you'd expect seeing documentation here. And the decision log, that's the history. Why did we make these decisions? Why did we choose X over Y or Y over X? And these things need to be kept up to date, relevant, and ideally lightweight. I don't want to start playing battleships with documentation, throwing away pages that just don't make any sense. Let's keep these things as small as we possibly can. And they're living, breathing, evolving documents. Let's not make the mistake of going back to, let's do big up, big up front design and get everything signed off, and then we start coding. Now, this is a piece of documentation that accompanies the code. It's a product-related document. It accompanies the software system, and it describes how it works and, and, and how we got there, essentially. If you want to, <laughs> I don't care how you do documentation as long as it's useful. A lot of people still use Word. You can throw it onto wiki pages like Confluence or SharePoint. Or, you know, there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, I have some customers uh, creating markdown files or ASCII.files, you know, one per section of my little guide bucket just showed you, and they kind of turn these things into HTML. That's, that's uh, a fairly good approach. 
Again, something I'm doing with Structurizer is I'm, I'm trying to combine the documentation and the diagrams into a single model so you can uh, simply uh, refer to all this stuff. If you're interested in documentation, there's uh, another template, another strategy called Arc42. Arc42 is very, very similar to the software guidebook thing I just showed you. Uh, there's a, a couple of books on LeanPub you can grab. And, and this guy's doing a lot of interesting work around the tool chain around documentation. So how do we, again, how do we automate a lot of this documentation? There's some really, really good stuff in there. How long should a document be? Well, let's not talk about numbers of pages. Let's talk about, if I'm a new joiner to your team, give me something I can read and consume in like one or two hours over a coffee or two to get a good starting point, an overview, a starting point for more exploration. That's really what I'm trying to do here. So finally, just briefly, exploring your code base, exploring your software architecture. And again, this comes back to modeling thing. Once you have a good model of your system, you can explore it in a number of different ways. It's just a number of different visualizations. So uh, here are some visualizations that I've thrown into Structurizer, but these are really easy. So the, the open source libraries create a JSON document, and this is just JavaScript D3. This is like 10 lines of code to create a, a nice sort of tree view. So this is a tree view of the, um, the static elements in the Spring Pet Clinic system. System, containers, components, really, really simple. If you have a, a map of all of your components, you can start to do things like, well, show me the, the ingoing and outgoing dependencies if I select this particular component of interest. Again, it's all in the model. We can just inspect it in different ways. We can do things like, show me a, uh, some sort of map of where my biggest components reside in my code base. Again, that's relatively easy to do once you have this model that you can explore. You can throw it into Neo4j in a graph database. Michael Hunger did this. Once it's in a graph database, because the software architecture model is just a graph, you can query it with Cypher. How cool is that? There's a whole product built around this approach. It's called uh, JQ Assistant. You basically point out a code base. You, you create some rules about what your components or your layers are. And again, it does the same thing. It allows you to write queries and check for violations during your build process. So again, you can do some really, really interesting stuff once you have a model of your software system. Uh, I've got some friends over at here, and, and they're building this product which takes the static view of a software system and superimposes the human elements on top. So you have a code, uh, a code base made up of modules or components or whatever. How does your team of developers map onto that? Are the boundaries aligned or, or are they overlapping? And there's some really, really interesting analytics that you can get from tools like this. So a quick summary. There's a really interesting little virtual panel about software architecture documentation on InfoQ from 2009, all that time ago. And you know, Grady Booch and Len Bass and Owen Woods are on here. And they all say things like this. You know, we should put the architecture in the code. We should get documentation with a click of a button. I don't think we're there yet, but some of the techniques I've outlined and, and spoken about this morning, I think, push us in the right direction. Some points to take away. Treat diagrams as maps of your code. They help you get a starting point. They help you explore. They help you navigate a large and complex code base. Documentation needs to describe what you can't get from the code. If you're just describing how all of your classes work and interact, stop. Right, shift the detail up one level of abstraction. This is all about tactics for better teams. I'm really interested in making teams communicate better through visualizing what they have. This makes things like uh, collective ownership of the code better. It makes things like big architecture refactorings much easier, because if you know what you have now and where you want to get to, it's a really simple transformation process. The one warning I will give you, especially around things like my diagramming technique, is if you don't know what you're doing, you'll be shown up fairly quickly. So when I, when I run these workshops, this is a true story, when, it, when I run these workshops, sometimes the more junior developers who have a, a, a much more technical focus are able to create better diagrams than the architects. And some organizations don't like that. <laughs> yes, the 1990s called, and they want their tooling back. Please stop using Visio. <laughs> it's 2016. We're supposed to be computer scientists or computer engineers or software engineers or whatever you want to call us. Why are we still using Visio? and Glyphy, and Draw.io, and all of these general purpose diagramming tools. Let's progress to the next level. Let's progress to some sort of engineering discipline. And how do we, how do, we do that? Lots and lots of ways. So if you want more information on the stuff I've spoken about, 
Uh, you can download my LeanPub book for free with this special coupon, so you have to use this by Friday, I think. Uh, there are a bunch of videos online where I've spoken about this topic in, in more depth before. If you go to Structurizer and you click the help link, all of the information about my documentation approach is all, is all there uh, for free to consume. And if you want a really quick overview of my C4 model, the Vox article is a really good starting point. Regardless of how you do all this stuff, my simplest advice is very simply create a ubiquitous language. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Simon. I want to run out and document something. <laughs> we have time for maybe one or two questions. Anybody? Corey. So, cynically, I ask, when it, it's always just sort of like brushed off of like, this needs to be a living document. And every time I've tried doing that, it ends up dying. And like, <laughs> nobody comes back. So do you have some suggestions for how to integrate it into being a part of like the team's process? And keep it from being that, oh crap, now it's, it, you know, it's, it's my four o'clock to five o'clock yeah. painful task to do, but how do, I, how do we make it so it's really, really integral that people value it? Yeah, um, so the, the very simplest tip I can give is if you have a definition of done for tasks or stories, stick a line at the bottom, have you updated the diagrams and documents? And then it's a five minute task rather than sitting there between four and five every day going, oh, that's it. That's the simplest tip I can, I can provide people. Other, oh, of Anything course. else? There's one right on the other side. Sorry. <laughs> this all sounds uh, pretty awesome. Actually, uh, when we do have code where we can embed all this information into, but how would you recommend going about this before we have any code uh, and integrating these tools into that? So before you have code, my, my, my general process for doing this is if I'm doing an upfront design exercise, I'll still use sheets of paper and whiteboards and things like that because that's a good way to create a starting point. It's, it's a good way to create that initial vision that a team needs to follow is the wrong word, but you know, that's, that's our direction that we, that we want to go. And once we start having codes, then I'll switch to using these sorts of techniques. So I, I'm not going to start doing upfront design using te these techniques because that's a bit overkill, really. So again, it's trying to be pragmatic and using the tools that we have uh, at the time that's most appropriate for them. Anything else before lunch? Yes, okay. front. Right, one more. Linda's going, whew. <laughs> So I've used the C4 model just for uh, on the whiteboard for my own understanding for conveying uh, yeah, these concepts to, f to friends and colleagues, but scaling it to the enterprise. What I see, a, big of, a bit of the problem is uh, having it in-house. Um, software as a service is great for some things, but there's, in some enterprises there are reluctance to use these services. Um, how do you see it scaling to the enterprise, having it in-house? and what kind of tools for the modeling is actually available now? So in, in terms of my structurizer thing, um, you're right, there, there are lots of companies I, I speak to and, and they think it's great, but they're not, they can't use it because it's on the cloud and the cloud is apparently dangerous, I discovered. Uh, so one, one of the things I'm doing is I'm creating an on-premises API, uh, so it, it, all the data stored locally. Um, it, it's funny because I, I see people using Gliffy a lot and Glyph is exactly the same thing. It's just a bunch of diagrams on the cloud somewhere. So I, I, I think a tooling in this area is pretty immature, actually. And there is, either needs to be a mind shift change to get people to use the cloud, or we need to start building some on-premise stuff. I, I don't know which the correct answer is. I would hope it's the cloud, because my, structure, my structurized stuff is all running on, on Pivotal Web Services, and it's an amazing platform. And I don't want to have to kind of lose a lot of that functionality to package up an on-premise version. That's the thing that really kind of bugs me. Cool. Thank you Thank again, you. Simon. Thank you very much.